Hi, I'm Michael Bradshaw, Vice President of Canem Collision and current board member of the Society of Collision Repair Specialists. Today we're here to talk to you a little bit about MIG welders, what's important when selecting a MIG welder, and also some of the important processes that you need to follow as a shop when you're performing MIG welds. But let's just go, go back to basics with the technicians. Most technicians do not have the, have the knowledge of what to, where to start. So where do I start setting this machine up? Inside your machines today, there are charts. They ask you how thick the metal is. Again, we don't have the ability to go out and measure the thickness of the metal, so we have a place to start. If you have no idea where to start, you're just playing with dials. By knowing your machine and knowing what it is capable of and having that data in there, it gives you a start place. So you open it up, you look at the gas that you're using, you look at the size of the wire, what type of wire, and it'll give you the wire speed and it'll give you the voltage that you should start with. Now you can start making your test welds and narrow it down so they become more efficient. Yeah, the, the, uh, on that point, the, uh, a lot of the newer machines, they do have presets in the machines to uh, get you going when you know the type of metal or the type of wire you're using or the thickness of the metal you're doing. But again, the presets are guides. The electricity we're using on the outlet, there could be, it could be a very hot day where air conditioners are turning on everywhere and the power is a little bit less. So the welder might perform a little bit different. So taking test pieces and taking test welds is critical. And on like Michael's point, you can't weld half the car together before you realize I have the welder set properly. Uh, it only takes one little weld to be done wrong that an airbag may deploy a millisecond difference that can really cause uh, harm to the um, owner of the vehicle. It's critical to do these test panels and to know how to do it. Uh, Toby has the most experience of all of us of doing that and training it. So where does people find out how to do that? How do I find out how to do a test panel? Well, I think a, a great place is the, the ICAR, all the ICAR instruction when it relates to welding, even their, their welding certification test, that's something they're pretty big on. I mean, it, it's in all their material. It's something they, they even want you to do when you're, when you're doing the certification course. I mean, so first and foremost, I think as an industry, you know, not only do we have to select the right equipment, we got to ensure our technicians are trained in using that equipment, a, a good place to start, um, just really because of accessibility for everybody is probably the ICAR test. Toby, you, you, you started to mention as far as where, where does that technician start in understanding what that setup and how you set that machine up, whether it be the, the wire selection, uh, gas selection, that's, that's something that we haven't really talked about. A lot of times we say, MIG welding, is, is that just kind of covers everything, but the reality is what we're doing with this is probably going to be a mag welding function versus a, a MIG welding. So the selection of the gas being an in, inert gas or an active gas, um, how does that affect the, the weld if you, if you select the wrong gas to use as a shielding gas or how does that work? The gas is the industry standard is a mixture of argon CO2. 75% um, argon, 25% CO2. Um, with the new Honda wire in their specifications, if you're using their new high strength wire, they want a mixture of 80-20. And again, this is not a readily available gas, you'd have to pre-order it. And the other gas would be straight argon, which you'd use for your MIG weld uh, brazing and aluminum. Um, again, you don't want to mix the two because if you take argon CO2 and, and, and introduce it to an aluminum weld, you just destroyed the metal. Right, so for, for a technician that doesn't understand the differences in, in the, the bottles of gas that they're using and why you make those selections to just go over, grab a, a, a new tank and put it on the welder and start, start firing, it's a very potential for, for massive failure. Yeah, we've, we've seen, um, because welders do have multiple guns and they can have multiple wires, they'll have a can of gas on the back for one of the particular wires. And somebody will immediately look at the welder that has a second gun on it, assume that same gas is used for that other wire. In reality, that welder should have had three bottles of gas on the back now, because Honda's gonna use its own gas, your aluminums are gonna use their own gas, 
and the standard MIG welding is going to use its own gas. So again, it is critical that you educate yourself on what kind of welder am I doing, what kind of wire am I doing, and what is the manufacturer's requirement for the job I'm doing. Again, where we get this training, uh, our industry right now uh, relies upon the ICAR MIG welding test, which is WCS03. Um, there's 10 welds that you perform, multiple th thicknesses. Uh, so you have to play with your machine because it's not one setting anymore. Um, and then they, you know, do a destructive test. We look for penetration, we look for tear out. So having that knowledge, again, most guys can take that test, but if they don't know how to take that and transfer it, the machine becomes a real problem. Uh, while we're talking a little bit about presets on welders, what, you know, what is your feeling, Andy, where you said it's gonna be multiple welders in the shop, not just a welder. Uh, there are gonna be welders that are requiring presets. So in your own instance, in your own shop, what kind of MIG welders are, you know, how many do you have to have to function? Well, I, I think there's obviously a, a, a function of how many technicians you have in the shop and, and how much welding you're doing on a, on a daily basis. Probably five different MIG mag welders that, that we're using. We've got, you know, from 220, we've got a Synergic Pulse welder for doing aluminum. We've got uh, another 220 welder that we're, we use for silica bronze welding. And then we've got, uh, you know, some, some 110s that, that we use for, for normal steel. It, it's just the, the technology that's in these welders today, uh, you know, and as it's advanced, the, the, the older welders are, are becoming antiquated to, to use today. Yeah, we, we, we also noticed the uh, metals in the cars change at such a rapid rate that um, you could have a welder that's certified and everything's fine in your shop, but you get required to buy another one. You know, Michael, you have certifications. How are your MIG welders? Do you have one that does everything? No, sir. Um, we've got several and are sometimes told we have to buy new ones all the time. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it's like Andy said, there's no one size fits all in this industry anymore. And, and I believe that stands true for pretty much any, any segment of the industry, but specifically with welders, you know, we've got 220 that, that maybe um, one manufacturer requires for their aluminum welding, whereas another manufacturer may require a completely different welder for, for their welding. So in some instances, you're going to have shops that have two or three welders just dedicated to aluminum. And then, you know, we've got the 220 for the silicone bronze and we have a, a 220 for steel and then a 110 for steel as well. And so it, it's all manufacturer dependent. And I think, you know, as a, as a shop owner, it, it's really a tremendous burden. Um, it's no longer just calling up a local distributor, hey, I need a new welder, when can you get me one? I mean, you have to do a ton of research. You, you've got to start, you know, like we've talked about, what are you working on first and foremost? What do I need this to do? Then you have to do the research, okay, well, what do the manufacturers call for that I'm working on? Is it a specification or is, is it a brand requirement? And then, so from there, you've got to look at, okay, does my facility have the, the right electrical requirements to, to run this welder that I need to buy? And then you've got to move from that and you've got to talk about, are my technicians trained in using the welder? Where do I, got to, you know, where do I need to send these guys so, so they can ensure their welder? And then sometimes even within all that, there's going to be a personal preference. Um, you may have a specification um, for, for voltage and amperage requirements of, of the machine and not necessarily a brand. So maybe you've got to try out two or three different brands and figure out what you and your technicians are more comfortable with. So it's, it's really a, a process. It's not something you can do within a day. I mean, I think the last water we purchased, we probably spent a month or, or more researching and, and, and making a, an informed, educated decision based upon that research. And one of the things that, you know, you have to really look out for, um, you know, sometimes, you know, there are people, distributors that, that sell equipment and, you know, they're honest and they, they want you to buy what you need and, and they're going to, you know, tell you what, what you need and what you don't need and what is going to fulfill the requirement. And then sometimes you run into others will say, oh, yeah, this will be good for that, when in fact it, it's not approved by that manufacturer. So it, it's, you know, it's a lot for a shop to consider. When he just was talking about the um, multiple welders, if you're normally going into a shop to train and you've been training a 110 MIG welder 
and the shop now has bought one of these pulse units and they expect you to come in and just instantly train the guys again and spend the normal amount of time. What are you noticing in a more time requirement the shop has to allow just for training for you of, to come in and do? Like, well, how much more time are you spending? How much less time are you spending? When we deal with steel, uh, we're not going to, uh, it's basically the same if it's a 110 or 220. Where we have the problems is the pulse machines for aluminum and MIG well brazing because that's a completely different process. Some are, the basics are the same, but you have movement, you have gun angle, and stick out. So these are some of the things that you have to retrain on. Here's the other part of the problem is you train today and you don't use it for a long time. And now you gotta go back and start all over again. And to your point, it usually takes uh, extra time for me to go back through and understand how the pulse machines work, why they are pulsed, um, what kind of substrate we're gonna be welding and what kind of wire we're gonna be using. So that does take some time and it, it needs to be reinforced on a faster, more uh, consistent basis instead of, well, I'm gonna do the aluminum welding today and uh, never pick up my welder for another six months. Right. And that's and then well, how do I set the machine? Or I get a, what about what about the technician who was trained on this machine and then leaves, and now you have nobody in there? Yeah, and I, I when we're talking about these pulse welders with MIG brazing, the purpose of it is on a pulse weld, the weld is going to come out and keep the metal really cool. It's pulsing the wire out, and the purpose is again to not overheat the metal. There's pulse welders and there's not pulse welders. Uh, there's a term that flies around the industry like pulse welding. Uh, there are welders that'll be like a pulse welder, but a pulse welder is a pulse welder. So if a requirement is pulse welding, make sure you buy a pulse welder. There's uh, many, many of these out there, but I, I always just tell people, make a little plan where, yeah, I'm going to become certified or it's my goal to be have a certain certification well, if that's the case, see what that requirement is and purchase your equipment accordingly so you spend your money wisely and you don't duplicate your investments. Andy's been, you know, does carry a big certification, a Tesla certification. Uh, you know, was there equipment that used in other certifications? Did you find when you did that homework that that was? Well, I think that's, that's part of the welding issue that, that a lot of shops are going through right now is as far as duplication that there, there is, there's a lot of duplication just because the certification programs or I should just say OEs in general have a specification for a specific welder. If that welder that you have doesn't hit five of the six that are out there and they've each got five different specifications or specific welders that, that are supposed to be used. I'm sorry if you want to, to do that, you're, you're, you're in for five or six different, different welders. Well, and sometimes I think the, the other issue, um, it's not, not necessarily com comes down to a specification requirement as it does a brand requirement. You, have, you may have a welder that meets all the same specifications that is, is of the brand that the manufacturer's requiring, but because it's not branded that way or sold and, and packaged a certain way, it's, it's not approved for that program. Obviously, we've talked a lot today about what to look for when, when purchasing a welder, the requirements and specifications from the manufacturers, personal protection for your employees, what's required as a shop with your electricity. If you have any more questions about this topic or you're looking for more information on others, please visit the Society of Collision Repair Specialists website. You can find us on the web at www.scrs.com.